Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. everyone. Welcome to Zeitgeist Design and Production. I'm Becky Kiefer, your studio director. Time travel is the ultimate experience. In fact, it's probably the most immersive and interactive attraction ever imagined. And here in the Zeitgeist Creative Studio in Pasadena, California, imagination rules and time is always of the essence. This is where experiential entertainment vets Ryan Harmon and Joe Lancicero study the past and spend the present envisioning the future of UXIRL, user experiences in real life. The Spirit of the Time Zoomcast offers a sneak peek behind the themes. Each month, we move without a ride system, inviting one incredibly talented and accomplished colleague aboard our time machine. We journey through that person's career, unraveling the mystery of what makes a guest experience timely, yet timeless. And because we're live, you're welcome to type in any questions into the chat box and our passenger will answer them, time permitting, of course. Climbing aboard our time machine today is former Disney Imagineer and current Chief Creative Officer and co-CEO of Meow Wolf. <sighs> Based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Meow Wolf is an arts and entertainment company that creates large-scale immersive arts installations that can currently be experienced in Santa Fe, Las Vegas, and Denver. It's now my pleasure to introduce our time machine pilots. Zeitgeist President and Chief Creative Officer, Ryan Harmon, and Zeitgeist Executive Vice President and Chief Art Director, Joe Lancicero, along with a woman who turns, into, it turns art into immersive experiences, Allie Rubenstein. Yay. Welcome. Hey, how are you, Ali? Woo! I'm look great. Who just came. Ah! Look, you just came. Except they're muted. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day we're gonna get it together. You know, it takes time. <laughs> Ali, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to hear from you. Oh, there they are. There you are. That's like the closest call. Whoa, we, we, in 1903. Three in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and almost hit the Wright brothers. Oh my Sorry God. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, this time machine <laughs> thing, tra time travel thing can be uh, a dangerous thing. You yeah. believe it's been 118 years since they flew and we still can't get leg room. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or, so. or a good upgrade. Anyway, <laughs> enough of this nonsense. It's great to be here today and wonderful to have Allie yes. here. Hey, let's take this off. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I'm just going to, I always start these things with a short testimonial. Um, you know, besides having traveled the world together, we were just talking, we've had meals in, in Holland and Hong Kong and Japan. Um, but, and more than that, um, just want, you know, Imagineering, my experience, you know, in Imagineering, you know, they, they said, you know, Imagineering is made up of dreamers and doers. And I worked with a lot of dreamers, mm -hmm. artists like ourselves, yes. and a lot of doers, you know, delivery people who really knew how to get it done. But it was right. that rare occasion when you would find somebody like Allie mm. that was that amazing combination of dreamer and doer. And um, I, you know, all the projects that we did together, you know, she took on this amazing role of, of taking the creative 
owning it, even though sometimes it wasn't hers, but owning it right. and putting her passion and heart and soul into making it great for the guests. And that was a rare thing. And I think that's what's made her so special, you know, then and now. Um, awesome. So with that little uh, intro, let's 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 get this time <laughs> machine moving. Where okay. are we? Welcome Where are board we? Alley. We are going to set the controls to 1973. We are in New York City on Broadway. Broadway. What are we doing here? I think what I was doing there was going to see a production of Jesus Christ Superstar, which oh. I think which. Um, was, I would say, the moment when I, seeing that show, and especially the opening of that show, and if anybody who's listening ever saw this original production that was on the West End and then came to Broadway, I was a kid, um, it was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant set design, um, brilliant live theater moment. Um, where it involved like the entire stage, the entire floor of the stage being vertical and then going horizontal and all these actors tumbling down in. And I was, I'm not going to say how old I was, but I was really young and, <laughs> and I was blown away. And I just was like, oh my God, I have to do that. I have to make something that amazing and cool. I just, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be those people. I wanted to figure out how it worked. I don't know. It was just the thing that inspired me. That was the first sort of true moment of inspiration, which I always thought was weird because I sort of spent my life in New York City kind of hanging out at the Met mostly as a kid. Um, and, but yet that was the moment that sort of was like, that solidified it for me. I was like, I gotta make that. Uh, now, was it your mom in, in the industry? Yeah, too? so she was, she was, I think, the assistant lighting designer on that production, but she was a lighting uh, designer. So I grew up in the theater world. My mom was a lighting designer. My father was a composer. All of my friends um, were in the theater world. And so I grew up in that world. And I used to play with, like, my mother. Remember those old uh, books of lighting gels? That like oh yeah 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 like a little fan right I used to like take make collages out of them them apart which probably didn't help my mother at all and like that yeah. was like the, and I'd like glue them to the walls and I that that <laughs> was like my first that was my first medium was that paper that yeah. <laughs> lighting gels lighting uh, gels yeah. <laughs> oh. so so a few years later we're at a boarding school what's going on here. So yeah, I went Please. to, um, I was really lucky. Um, my, my family, my parents decided they were going to move to California. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. Please send me to boarding school. So <laughs> they did. And I ended up in this very small, um, very small sort of commune like boarding school in Massachusetts called Buxton. And it had a very small theater, but a great theater, a great theater program. Um, which of course I immediately jumped into. I was like, yay, I want to be a lighting designer. Let me go hang lights. I can do this. Um, and uh, and for the strange thing there, the teacher uh, at, at this particular school had a point of view that if women um, were to lift things like light fixtures or scenery, they would um, tip their ovaries. So <laughs> I was not... <laughs> no, it was very striking, and I, I think there's actually a couple people on this call watching this who who went to school with me who know this story and can attest to it that we were as women told that. So I um did makeup instead, and oh by the way, I was not very good at makeup. Like that was not my thing at all. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, but I did makeup and theater for. Uh, for four years in high school, just to be in the theater, in the barn. I think it was called yeah, the barn. Yeah, yeah wow. it was pretty great. Okay. Wow. And that so, was in so Williamstown, Massachusetts, which by the way, was the same town that my parents met in doing summer stock theater, Williamstown Theater Festival, which was, for those of you who don't know, like one of the pre preeminent theater, summer stock theater festivals in America. I was um, conceived there, by the way, <laughs> and I uh, performed there, I know, as a child and um, was terrible. I sang off key and then went back there as an apprentice uh, lighting designer as well um, years later. So spent a lot of time in, in, in that town. Okay. 
So you graduate in 1982 and you're off to Sarah Lawrence and you're studying photography? Yeah, I decided I took on, I got a weird bug up my butt to like get into photography. Um, I was really, really just really excited by, uh, I mean, that was back in the day when you could still like develop film and paper and be in a dark room and do make really amazing art with with the paper and the chemicals and, and light. And, and that just became a really, um, uh, inspiring medium for me. I mean, I'm, a, I'm such a paper person. I still am as Joe knows, like I, I, I like paper, like I print oh, everything. Yeah. I kill trees. It's kind of tragic, but I like the tactileness of paper and, and that photography and being able to sort of create these images was just such a turn on, but I was still really jazzed by theater. So I, I created this bizarre combo, um, kind of major, I, where I was photo using theater as the subject matter for a photography major. So I spent a lot of time in the theater. I was still studying lighting design, but I spent a lot of time photographing kind of what I was creating, the photographs that I was creating, if that makes sense. So I was sort of creating these theatrical moments that I could then photograph. And that sort of became my medium for a couple of years at Sarah Lawrence um, until we had a little bit of a falling out. Do I tell that story? <laughs> sure. I, was, I was I was working in the, the I was I had a work study program at Sarah Lawrence and they um got sort of wrongfully accused of stealing props from the uh prop department there and had a little bit of a uh headbutting with the head of theater and um left <laughs> by, by my choice. I did not steal the props, by the way, in case anybody okay. <laughs> I did not. But now we're here in California. California. What are you doing in Valencia? So, so then I go to Cal. So then I went to California and studied the arts. Like some of my favorite people in the world went to California and studied the arts, and um, joined the theater program there. Designer. Um, very quickly, I met uh, my a teacher there named Michael Devine, who mm -hmm. was teaching scenic design at the time, and. Um, I, he became a, such an inspiration to me. Um, he really just, uh, I mean, he was a brilliant designer uh, in and of himself, and he was such an inspiring teacher and so supportive and encouraging. Uh, I very quickly switched over and ended up focusing on scenic design for theater for, um, I stayed there for three years. My poor parents paid for an extra year of college. I don't know how, how we did that, but uh, I, you know, I got to spend a lot of time with Michael, which was fantastic. And some other really amazing designers who came out of that program. And um, yeah, and uh, graduated there with a degree as a, a set designer and um, went from there to the, uh, Center Theater Group immediately to the Mark Taper Sport Forum and spent a couple years as the assistant scenic designer there. And that's where I really started to learn my the business of and craft of uh, scenic design because I got to work with um, amazing designers there, Heidi Landisman, and I mean, just so many different designers. Um, it was pretty extraordinary. I was very, 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 very lucky. So now you have all these theater design skills and it's a uh, time machine we're now around 1987 to 1994 period like and I see a mullet. did you see a mullet <laughs> I did yeah not mine <laughs> so um did you hear television calling I think I might have I think I might have heard my like rent bill calling <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened um and yeah, so, you know, I mean, all of us in LA at that time, we were kind of all doing, we, a lot of us all that came out of Kell Arts, we were doing a lot of equity waiver theater. And then we were doing like uh, some television shows, videos, kind of whatever we could do. I was doing a lot of set decorating and, and um, I really, I've always been a huge fan of film. Um, I love to watch film. My stepfather was a critic and a film historian. I spent a lot of time watching movies and I sort of gravitated to film and television. And I ended up working on a TV show called uh, Babylon 5, a number of years. And um, with uh, 
John Iacovelli, who was the production designer on that, who was a great friend and a wonderful designer. And um, I, I spent a few years doing television and that was where I sort of, you know, doing a show like Babylon, you know, it was a, a four wall sets and multiple four wall sets. And we were constantly moving through an evolution of different designs and, you know, different planets. And I, I it was, you know, a sci many of you know, it was a big sci-fi show at the time. Um, and it was so fantastical and we could really kind of create anything we wanted. And I mean, I was going to like Ikea and buying vases and turning them upside down and sticking a ball on them. And suddenly they became like, you know, the control tower for some spaceship <laughs> or something. And so it was like, it. right. And it was, so it was like, this is amazing opportunity to turn stuff into other stuff. And people believed it was the other stuff. And yeah. it became like part woven into the narrative of this extraordinarily intricate story um, that was happening on this TV show. Anyway, so that was sort of like the first time I really was like, wow, like creating these other worlds that you can really be immersed in. And the idea of like turn, like taking things that exist in our world and transforming them in a way to something that, that is unexpected. And I think that that was sort of a first a little spark for me in that kind of that realm happened on Babylon 5. Wow, and you know, you, that makes, makes total sense. I mean, your trajectory, your career, you know, how you could use that at Disney, but how that really plays into your current role. Exactly. Owl, now where, you know, yeah. they're, they're taking, you know, a lampshade from here. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot more handmade. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about your thing about loving to touch the paper. I think that's the thing I love about Meow Wolf. Is it's real tactical right. experience, you know, made by artists. But we're getting ahead yeah, of ourselves. Ahead of our, sorry, right. sorry. So, <laughs> Couldn't help but go there. So, so we're here between eighty-seven and ninety-four in this realm. It seems like you're doing all these TV shows and equity waiver shows. And tell us about some of those. Um, oh, geez, do I have to remember all that? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of theater in LA. A lot of I did a lot of theater at the LA Actors Theater. Um, I did a lot of like music videos, and um, you know, we were one, yeah. yeah, we were all. I mean, we were all just sort of trying. We were all just trying to make a living back then, and you know, I, I was really, really lucky. Um, in that I, I kept working somehow too. Like I was young, I was right out of school, but there was just constant, constant work. I don't think I've stopped working since then. Um, and, you know, and being able to, and I jumped from medium to medium. So I would be doing a theater show and then we would be just shooting a music video and then um, doing, you know, and then I was in then Babylon five and, and then film and television and, and, and documentary television, which wasn't really documentary. And I mean, I was sort of flipping around into all these mediums and, you know, Joe sort of talked about the dreamers and the doers. And I think this is where I started to really become a doer because, you know, my mother, I remember I was telling this to somebody yesterday. Um, my mother once said to me when I was really young, she said, and, and I offer this advice to anybody out there who wants to get into, I mean, it really wants to do anything that they're at all passionate about. She said, just say yes, and then go figure it out. And, <laughs> and, and it was really, it was that like little tiny piece. She also said, learn to type, but don't tell anybody you know how to type. Um, she also <laughs> said that too, but <laughs> that was, you know, a long time ago before computers. <laughs> But that little piece of advice was like, it, it just released me from the fear, from fear and a fear of failure, first off, because it was kind of like, all right, I'm just going to say yes and figure it the heck out. And yeah. that really worked. And it allowed me to step into just about any job that came my way that was vaguely related to the world of designing and dreaming. And um so I got to do, I just got to do, I got to do so many different things. So many different wow. things. Wow. So, so fast forward in 1994, we appear to be in, in the land of the rising sun, sun in uh, Japan. Wakiyama, right. Wakiyama, Japan. How did, what, what movie or TV show or equity theater is here? None, absolutely yeah. none. And so, yeah, I think if we are going in the right order, and I think we are, because we did talk about 
I think we're going in the right order. So I don't even remember exactly how it happened, but probably I just said yes to somebody. <laughs> um, who said, you know, we need we need a we need a set decorator and an art director for this theme park we're building in Japan. Um, it was Universal was sort of getting their feet wet in in re getting ready to do Universal uh, Osaka. And they tried out this little park when they were part of uh, Mitsubishi Investment and Development Group. And they tried out this little park, wasn't so little, in Wakayama, Japan. And I even know there's people on here who work there as well. Um, it's such a small world. And uh, so somebody, yeah. I, I don't know how it, I don't even remember how it happened, but I probably just said, sure, I can do that. And um, I got on a, literally got on a plane and went to uh, to Osaka and down to Wakayama. And um and stepped into the world of fully immersive theme park design. And that was where I really was like, everything kind of clicked. I was like, okay, this, that people can walk through and have transformative experiences and that will live on for themselves sentimentally and intellectually and will will mm -hmm. somebody's going to have the same reaction to this that i had to jesus christ superstar 20 something years before and yeah, they're going to yeah. look at a thing and they're going to remember it and it all kind of came together for me at that moment and i remember pouring um a bunch of concrete footers for fake flowers to stick on balconies in this sort of mediterranean village and just thinking wow, concrete rocks. Like, this is awesome. I want to make four more concrete stuff and make cool stuff out of concrete that people are going to see and, and that they're not going to know it's there. Like the, the whole sort of, and this was the sort of like dreamer doer thing again. For me, what was really exciting is like all the things we had to do to make it, to make a wonderful world for the visitor or the guest and they had no idea what we were doing and they had no idea what went into it and that piece of it for some reason really turned me on to like wow. be that behind the scenes person who figured that out yeah. so concrete then became your favorite media <laughs> second absolutely. only to like, uh, little gels uh, you uh, know, your mom did. <laughs> absolutely concrete and i think concrete to this day might remain my favorite medium concrete and clay <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, cool. so where are we now? So, so I think we're going to move to 1995, and it appears you are working on what would become the biggest motion picture of all time. Yeah, like another sort of random, I don't even know how I got that gig moment, but I said I, yes. I said <laughs> yes. Like I, somebody, I don't, I don't know how it happened, but um, I became the set decorator for Titanic. Um, for all of the contemporary uh, present day parts of the film. Um, I had gone union on Babylon 5, so I was suddenly a union set decorator. So I could do something like Titanic, which is I sort of, uh, was, I, I couldn't even imagine that work. And, and I didn't even at the time understand how big a movie it was. I had no idea. I was just busy trying to like make furniture sink because we were building we were building the in, in the, the the wreckage i don't know if anybody remembers um the opening shot of titanic with the the rover going through the water and seeing the ship and going in and finding the safe and pulling out the the painting and all that we built all that in an offshore water basin and um which was like a giant giant swimming pool giant um, uh, in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And so I had to build, you know, I had to design and build the safe and the bed and the plate and the painting and all of the, the stuff that you see, the furniture. And we built it all at a shop here in LA and we shipped it all down to the offshore water basin and we did, put it in and we set, we built the set and we painted it and we set decorated and we had the safe and we had the, pa the paper, we did all the things. And we filled the whole thing with water. It was about, oh gosh, I, I want to say it was 15 or 20 feet deep. It was maybe more. I don't know. It was deep, deep. Filled the whole thing with water. And every prop that I had built floated to the surface. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. So we had to drain the whole thing, pull everything out. And I had this whole crew of people spend like two days drilling out 
like and filling everything with lead shot so that everything uh -huh. and then filling it up and so that everything would sink and hold down the <laughs> so yeah that was uh my titanic one of the one of my titanic experiences wow. yeah wow wow so that that took you to what 96 and then you had a call from somebody i had a call from um well I, I'm trying to remember like how this started, how the whole Disney thing started. Um, but I ended up on the phone a number of times with a woman named Jody McLaughlin, who um, became my, who Joe, you know, very well. Um, yeah. Who, who um, saw in me luckily and Jody was always is so brilliant at recognizing um, talent and understanding what people's skills are. And she and I met at Imagineering. I interviewed, I think I interviewed for props or something or set decorating, because that's what I did. I was a union set decorator by that point. And uh, she was like, you know, no, you're a production designer. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that is, but cool, I'll do that. Yeah. And uh, yes. She, uh, yes, exactly. All right, yes. And she, she said, all right, let me, let me work on this. And, and I was sitting in a restaurant having dinner uh, one night and I get this call and she says, um, they want you. And I was like, who? And she said, well, they're do we're building this park, Tokyo Disney Seas. And uh and you're gonna work with uh, Steve Kirk and Tim Kirk. And I see Tim Kirk right on my screen right there. <laughs> um, and she was like, literally, I remember her voice. They want you and when you're gonna be a production designer. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but yes, okay. And so um, that's when I went and joined Walt Disney Imagineering. Wow. wow. And then once again, you're on a plane and Yep. Off to Japan. Back, Off back. to Japan. I got to spend a, a year or so in Glendale, kind of getting to know everybody. Um, uh, Michael Devine came back into my world then. He was one of the art directors. He and, and Tim and I all worked very closely together. Um, spent Went to London together, went to New York together, did some research together, um, traveled, to, did a lot of travel together. But Michael... Um, sort of came back into my life as, as he was one of the uh, creative directors on that project and and really helped me kind of learn the business of theme park design in the Disney vernacular, in the Disney world, no pun intended. Um, you know, and I, so I got to spend some time in Glendale with, with him um, and he was, you know, and Jody and uh, a few others that were just such, um, the whole Kirk family, by the way, that were really just such inspirations and so supportive of me and just kept challenging me with stuff like here, we've got to figure out this building. Let's, let's talk about how this building design is gonna work. And I just say, yes, and do it. And sometimes I pissed people off because I just did stuff. Um, as a production designer, as I tried to figure out what production design was, because it was, a little amorphous. Um, there was no guidebook. There was no job description. It was just like, here, you're going to be the person that's going to get inside the heads of the creative individuals, the creative directors, the likes of the Tim Kirks and the Steve Kirks and, you know, and the Tom Morris's and all of these people. And you're going to get in their head and you're going to execute what they want to see. And you're going to make that happen. And I was like, and, and that sort of worked for me really, really well. Cause I was, a, I was a good designer. I was a very good designer, but I was not um, as inspired to be the vision person as I was to be the person who executed on the vision. And I loved that. And to be the challenge of, of, of pulling something out of somebody's brain, which I did with you, Joe, a lot and like understanding, getting in someone's head and, and executing on what their vision was and bringing that to life, um, that was that I, was just something that really clicked for me. And, and I, I think that, yeah, it really clicked for me. You know, what you just described, I think, is what made Disney product great. In fact, I, we were mm -hmm. having lunch with Tom, Tom Morris the other day, who was our first guest on the Time Machine. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about the whole idea of plusing. And this went all the way back when Walt and what I learned at Cal Arts and, and studied and when I studied animation from the guys that work with Walt right. was like, 
always take your assignment, even if, even if it's not your thing, you know, someone else before you came up with that and look at it and think, how can I make this better? Not different, right, right. but better. better. And yeah. And I think it was that mindset, which you obviously had that made the product so great. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody always looking at this thing in front of them go, this is great, but hey, how can it be better? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, it, and I think it's also removing a big piece of it is removing your own ego from the equation too, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, and that's, I think that, you know, it's something that comes easy for me, not for everybody. And that's cool. Yeah. You know, um, we all have to follow our own paths and be authentic to who we are. But to me, it was like, it, I never wanted to be that the person in the front of it. I wanted, always wanted to be the person who could help make something better, who could maybe, you know, behind the scenes kind of, help and support and move and shape and, you know, carve the concrete and sort of turn it into something that um, I didn't need to be front and center on. Um, I, I wanted to represent. Wow. So we're now in 2001. It's 2001. It's the morning before, before this park, park opens, opens and it looks yeah. like you are walking, walking around by yourself <laughs> as the sun is rising. Yeah. This is, a, this is another <laughs> seminal moment. <laughs> it was. I sort of, I have this thing that I do now that whenever I open a place, a park, uh, now it's an exhibition, um, to like take a moment at the crack of dawn and walk the park. And I remember the feeling in Tokyo when we, in Tokyo Disney Seas, when we opened that morning and I was walking through American Waterfront and the ops folks, um, you know, where they were washing down the street and the street was wet and it was glistening and the sun was coming up and it was dead quiet and I was by myself. And it was probably just sort of the, uh, it was such a sort of moment of peace and clarity and just pure freaking joy um, to just enjoy this thing that we had all, that this group of amazing individuals had created together. But I had my my little personal private moment to just enjoy it by myself, and and now I do that every time, I, whatever I open, whatever I do, I try and take a moment because I, I just for me to enjoy it for me, um, that, by myself it, alone. Completely, yeah, completely understand. Because when you're in the trenches, when you're in the throes of building these things, mm -hmm. there's so much going on. You seldom have a moment to take a deep breath and just stand back yeah. and and look at what's going on. So. That's the, that was yeah. a very uh, smart thing, you know, to be or yeah. allow yourself to, yeah. to do that. So now you've taken this walk and all of a sudden they're ready to open the gates up and you're standing yeah. I was standing there with Janny. Um, Tim might have been there. I was standing there. I was somehow lucky enough to be there for opening day, um, which was kind of a miracle. Uh, but and standing there with Janny and literally as we did the rope drop and people come running in and I had experienced, I'd never seen a rope drop at Disney. Um, embarrassingly enough, I had not spent a lot of time at Disneyland at this point. I was not, I, this was all sort of a new world to me still. Um, and I watched the rope drop and the people coming in and I just, what Janie and I just started weeping and the flood of emotion. I mean, when, you know, when you're, when you've, poured your heart and soul into a thing for, we were there for what, two years building this. I was only there for two years. There were folks who were there a lot longer than me um, building this extraordinary thing. And then you see the like rush of people who are just dying to experience the thing that you've helped to create that you've been, I was a small, small part of it, but oh my gosh, um, the tears. I was, I was a mess. I was a mess that day. <sighs> So rewarding. Wow. Uh, yeah. So back to Glendale and what happens? <laughs> um, I didn't get laid off, which was kind oh, of a wow. miracle, right? Um, that sort of was, uh, that, that tends to happen a lot, you know, in companies like Imagineering, where we do, we build up, build projects and then come back and there's nothing to do. Um, but I got back to Glendale, miraculously did not get laid off. And, uh, joined the Hong Kong Disneyland team um, and began working on Hong Kong based park. And I was a production designer for Fantasyland. I got to work, I was primarily working with Lori Coltrane, um, which was one of my, one of my dearest friends. 
And um, yeah, we, we, that was my first time working on something that really was rooted in true Disney IP. That was when I started to really have to, I had to learn the names of the princesses and who the Fab Five were and all of that stuff that I kind of got to skip over in Tokyo Disney Seas a little bit. I didn't really have to do it. Um, so then that was when, the, but then there I was, <laughs> Fantasyland. Wow. So back to Asia now. Back to Asia. <laughs> So, okay. Back to Asia, back to Hong Kong, Hong Kong based park, fantastic experience working with another extraordinary team. Um, and, um, and, and then really got, came to appreciate and, and, and truly love um, the Disney IP and which I, I, you know, that was a whole learning experience for me. I did not come, like, as I've said, I did not come to working at Disney as a Disney fan. I mean, I wasn't not a fan, but I wasn't, that wasn't what I was seeking in my career. I sort of stumbled, I said, yes, and stumbled into it. Um, so really getting to know the IP and getting, you know, I was working on Winnie the Pooh and the Alice teacups and building a Dumbo ride and a uh, carousel and Orbitron and, and all these, all the, all those roundy rides um, and learning the more of the history and the stories that were, that informed um, fantasy land that informed the parks, the castle parks. Mm -hmm. um, I had the honor of at that time, we were, they were rehabbing the carousel in Anaheim, and they had taken the whole thing apart. So I, we were able to take the original carousel from Anaheim and pull tools from it, pull molds from it, oh, oh, and wow. recreate it uh, it was an absolute recreation of the carousel in Anaheim. So being sort of like reproducing the park in Hong Kong, which was essentially a reproduction minus a street of Anaheim um, and really getting to be immersed in the, the history of Disney, the hi history of the castle parks. Mm -hmm. I learned so much on that project and, um, and being able to do something like reproduce the carousel was so special. Um, it was really, it was kind of an honor. I, I felt really honored to be wow, able to do that. And I learned how to build round rides. Like who knew? I don't know. Sure. I'll do round rides. So I built a bunch of round rides. So what was it like working with Tom Morris who works with us? Here yeah. I mean, it was wonderful. You learned to love the color purple a lot. Um, which, <laughs> <laughs> which I did. Whole story. <laughs> whole other story, which I do now. And I kind of think about Tom a lot when I, <laughs> um, but uh, it was one, I mean, he, I mean, he's a, such a wealth of knowledge and he was, I mean, that, that was, it was like going, it was going to school with him, you know, in so many ways, because he just um, knew, knew so much about all of the things that I didn't know about, about Disney and also about design um, and designing environments at that scale. Um, he, he really, he was, so he was very, he was patient and he was inspiring and he clued me in on many things that I didn't know because there were many things I didn't know. Um, but he was always supportive and always answered the question and he always knew what he wanted. Um, and he was very clear in that I found. And I was, that was, that was a great experience working with him and learning to love the color purple. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> All right. So it's September 12, 2005, Hong Kong Disneyland is opening. You're going to be on a plane uh, back to uh, probably to, Cal uh, probably California, and I think I spent a little bit of time working on um, DCA. Right? right? Is that what happened? Yeah, DCA. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yes, I was Indeed. working. Indeed. Yes, I spent a little time working on DCA, reconcepting um, the, the raft ride there in the front of the park. Um, and I was commuting down to Anaheim almost on a daily basis for a while. And I had this moment of realization that that commute to Anaheim from Pasadena was way more painful than flying to Asia every two weeks. And I was like, get me back on an Asia project. So um, luckily, Joe, um, you and your team were working on blue skying um, what was gonna be the Hong Kong expansion. And uh, Jody and 
Robert Coltrane and a whole group of us spent uh, months, months and months and months and months, um, spent some really great times together trying to figure out what to do for the Hong Kong expansion. And I joined that team, luckily. And that's where I got to work with you for the first time. Oh. They were, we affectionately called it the chili pepper. The it chili was because pepper. the the area, the spit, the spit of land, the spit of land was shaped like a chili pepper. And I, I, you know, when I left Disney a couple years ago, there was still a printer that was called chili pepper that because we had <laughs> eaten the chili pepper back then. And I think it was still called chili pepper when I left. So anyway. Well, I don't know if a lot of people listening know, but there was another land that was supposed to take the place uh, what became Toy, Toy Story, Story Land. Land. That's right. You were the show producer, obviously. That's Tell us about right. that. In your I was. So we spent right. some, it was going to be, we thought, well, you know, Hong Kong being the hot, hottest, hottest, one of the hottest places on the planet. Not really, but yeah. oh man, it was hot there. <laughs> Um, yeah. We thought, well, what we need is a, we need an Arctic land. So we designed, and I think we got well into probably through DD even on that thing. Oh, yeah. Wow! Wait, well, I, there were working drawings. There wow. were working yeah. drawings. We uh, um, to build us out this Arctic land. It was an Arctic research center, and it had a great ride. And we had fake snow, and um, we were trying well, to. Real snow. Well, real <laughs> snow, and we did it. We, we had real snow that I that. The, the the one of the great one of the greatest coups um, of of my time at Disney was the fact that I found we found what was at the time the best fake snow machine in the world and that best fake snow machine in the world was in the truly hottest place in Dubai so myself and a bunch of other folks hopped on a plane to Dubai Skip Lang and I and some others hopped on a plane to Dubai to go see Ski Dubai to witness the best fake real snow in the world, the best fake real snow machine in the world. And it was, it was fantastic snow. Um, wow. So we learned a lot about that snow machine. We spent a lot of time, Joe, I don't know if you remember, but we spent a lot of time to figure out how to integrate that snow machine into that ride so that we could okay. be blasting wow. snow. Um, we didn't quite get it all figured out. So we went back to Dubai. <laughs> um, just to make sure we had that snow right and um yeah but it was a fantastic it was a it was a great land it was going to be so great and uh but unfortunately at the time um there was another the other park in hong kong joe i think correct me if i'm wrong here they were opening an arctic land as well and uh, yeah uh, right and because the government had a, a uh, uh, an interest oh, right. in the Disney park, a controlling interest. Right. They were concerned that there would be, it looked at as, you know, we copied them because uh, especially I think they were opening, but th what they were doing was so different from what we were totally. doing, but because they were the controlling interest, they said, no, sorry, you can't do wow. that. And that's when we had to scramble and then do the Toy Story instead. Right. But that gave Allie another great opportunity because it was another land that needed her right. There was. So, wait, so wait, question: Could this have been the last time that Disney created new lands not based on the intellectual property? Grizzly Gulch yeah. and uh, it's it's Mystic, it? Point. Mystic Point. Yeah, yeah. I'm those sure were. Been... Yeah, so. there was a little bit in Shanghai, but these were really the last two like full-on lands that were absolutely one hundred percent unique and had no no relationship to any existing Disney IP. And um, I don't think I understood at the time, I don't think I fully grokked at the time, the kind of import of that moment. Um, oh. And now, now I do, but it was, yeah, I got, I had the opportunity to take on the land Grizzly Gulch, um, still to date, sorry, Meow Wolf, my favorite project of all time, sorry, Shanghai. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but the, I mean, and you know, we built this fantastic ride that had a launch and a backward section and a great story overlay and a beautiful land. And we built a we built this giant concrete mountain. Um, <laughs> You, you know, to play with a lot of concrete. A lot of con oh my gosh, there was so much concrete. Do you remember how thick those friggin' walls were? Oh my gosh, so much concrete. And 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 I was really lucky in that I got you know I Skip Lang, who was you know one of the geniuses of of storytelling and storytelling with Rockwork, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, but was such an amazing man and amazing individual. Brilliant. 
Really, really brilliant. Um, he he did the you know initial design for Grizzly, and again, what I got to do then, he then went to work on uh, Shanghai, um, but he turned he he entrusted me, he and and Robert and 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 you Joe as well, because I mean you sent me off to the field to execute on this thing, trusted me to execute on their vision, and that was you know a little terrifying, but again, yes. Um, and I built a mountain. We built a mountain. I mean, an extraordinary team of, of carvers and ride engineers and art directors and um, painters. And it, it was, you know, I think I like to think that what we did, what we were, what we executed on myself and um, Tim White, who did area development and like Gordon Meyer, who did all the, the paint work. And I would think, I think that what we ended up with was what you all envisioned. At least I hope it was better than it was what you all envisioned. way better. Wow. You yeah. plus it, plus it, plus it. it was, and that, yeah. that was, that was just the most fun. Um, and, and we, I think we created, it was such a, Truly, what was great about that chili pepper project is even though there were these three little lambs that were sort of smushed together on the backside of that park, they were completely each and every one Grizzly Gulch, Mystic Point, and Toy Story Land, absolutely immersive, absolutely transformative. You absolutely believed you were in, you know, the gold rush. It was, you know, it was August 8th, 1888. You absolutely were immersed in that, and it was a tiny little lamb, but it worked. Wow! That's yeah, awesome. we could we could spend the rest of our yeah. time <laughs> talking about we and, and all the great times we had. And <laughs> there were a one, lot. <clears throat> the first time I did a Chinese fire drill in yeah. a uh, in a Kong with Ali. <laughs> I All think right. it was my first and my last. It was a little yeah, dangerous. Maybe, maybe been my only, but <laughs> anyway, let's move forward. So September yeah. 12, 2005, here you are doing your meditative walk around the park. Yep. And, uh, and I guess you come back. And what happens now in Glendale? Managed to not get laid off again. And <laughs> kept happening um, and joined the, uh, I was lucky enough at that point then to join the Shanghai team. And um, I took on a portion of Fantasyland. Lori Coltrane, again, was uh, doing Fantasyland. And I came in to help with that. I, long story short, ended up with primarily focusing on um, the voyage to the Crystal Grotto, which was a boat ride um, that went around Fantasyland and under the castle. Um, it had been designed originally by Steve Davison. Well, it actually had been concepted by a number of individuals. It had gone through a lot of more, more it morphed into many different attractions. But by the time I got a hold of it, Steve Davison had done the design. And again, I was executing on his vision. Um, but that was what I loved to do. And so I took over the creative direction. I think I was an executive producer by that time and took on this sort of hybrid role, a lot of left brain, right brain stuff at this point, you know, sort of don't spend so much money, but I need to spend some, we need more money, but you've got to cut the budget, but I need to spend, you know, it was a lot of that kind of conversation, yeah. with yeah. <laughs> um, which I still do to this day. Uh, but so I took on the Voyage to the Crystal Grotto. Another thing, I'd never done a boat ride. Um, it was a fountain show. I'd never done a fountain show, but yes, of course I could do that. We can figure that out. Um, and then the castle ultimately um, uh, took the castle over as well as the art director with, I mean, a ginormous team of brilliant people. I mean, all I was there was to support them and, you know, remove road rocks and, and help everybody who was working on that that castle be their most brilliant selves. But um, yeah, so I had the honor of both producing the castle, uh, the largest castle, largest contemporary castle ever built in Shanghai and uh, the boat ride that the sort of fantastical, magical, crazy boat ride that went underneath the castle as well yeah. um, in Shanghai. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. Awesome. And did you get that moment of walking through the park before opening? And I did. And that was actually, this is really embarrassing. And for uh, those of you who are watching who were on Shanghai, um, I know there's some of you out there. Uh, I walked the park the morning of opening and it was the first time I walked through Tomorrowland because I had not to that point left out of in three years in Shanghai, I had not <laughs> left Fantasyland. 
Wow. <laughs> and uh, you know, we got a little got a little myopic there for a while. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so I did my meditative walk and watched the park open again and and tears again and uh um yeah it was it was a magic that was very special that was you know it was shanghai that was a special experience yeah. where we are right now but it looks like it's dark it's nighttime you're sitting on a computer and it looks like you're on linkedin yeah and i was back at disney and i was having a day and um i thought oh well what the heck i'm just gonna click open to work. Um, I, it, it wasn't anything like, oh, I want to leave Disney or, or, or there was just, it was just sort of a random, like, hmm, maybe I'll try this. So I clicked open to work and literally three hours later, I got a call from Sean Diani, who was one of the original co-founders of Meow Wolf saying, hey, we're looking for a producer for a new project we're doing. Um, at the time it was in, in uh, DC. And uh, are you interested? And I was like, Meow yeah, Wolf, wait a minute. I know you guys because when we we were, when Shanghai Disneyland won a TIA award, we were all sitting in the theater watching the awards and Meow Wolf, this company that none of us knew anything about, won an award and they showed a sizzle reel and we all sat there. I remember looking over at Luke Marin and we were all like, what is, what is this? This looks incredible. Like we gotta go see these, this thing. Anyway, they called me up and they were like, hey, are you interested? And I said, yes, <laughs> maybe, maybe um, this is a whole new idea, because by this point, I'd been at Disney for 22 years. All I knew was theme park design and I didn't know anything about Meow Wolf. And uh, but yeah, went and checked them out and um, went to Santa Fe and found this group hmm. of extraordinary, inspiring artists making authentic, kind of chaotic, over the top, um, transformative experiences. Well, one in particular in Santa Fe. And um, I sort of, I, I talked to them, spent some, I spent about six months talking to them. And when, and I, you know, I, I, it wasn't some, it was, it was interesting because I wasn't really prepared at all to leave Disney, which was my family and what I loved, but they, Meow Wolf gave me an opportunity and then said, Hey, you want to come be the chief creative officer? And that, then the light, the, that's when the light bulb went off. And I said, wow, that's an opportunity to help build a brand new creative studio and to help support a bunch of people, artists, and humans who maybe don't quite know exactly how to step into the world they've stepped into, which was themed entertainment. Wow. Um, and I thought, all right, this is an interesting opportunity. And oh, by the way, if you haven't been to Santa Fe, it's absolutely stunning. <laughs> and yeah. so, so there, so I said, okay. And I went, um, what, two and a half, almost three years ago. Yeah. yeah. So you moved on to Santa Fe? I moved and to Santa Fe. And what are you doing now? What is your role? What are you so I moved there. I, I joined Meow Wolf as the chief creative officer, and um, it was beyond inspiring um, I and challenging and terrifying um, working with what, what, what was the biggest surprise to me was I was really afraid. I was a little bit afraid and in, in afraid may be a strong word, but concerned that in going to Meow Wolf, I wasn't going to maybe find the same level of talent that I had experienced over the 22 years of Imagineering where we have so many of the best of the best. And I was blown away by the skill level, the talent, the inspiration that, and, and then just the like kindness and receptivity to receptiveness um, to my coming in of that, with that whole creative team um anyway three months in um the board of directors asked myself and my chief creative officer and uh chief financial officer chief content officer sorry and uh chief financial officer the three c-suite members of the team to form 
the office of the CEO because the, the CEO at the time um, wanted to go focus on some other things and, and step aside. So they asked us to form a temporary office of the CEO. Um, so I became um, ostensibly one of the CEOs of Meow Wolf. Now, um, when they said, do you want to do this? I said, yes. And having mom was there less talking. than no idea what it would take to run with my mother's voice, right? Like no idea what it was going to take to run a company. I think I might have said yes and gone and possibly thrown up. It's possible <laughs> <laughs> because suddenly we were, I was taking on the running of a, of a startup company that had just had a huge tranche of funding from a, a, a private cap, you know, private equity firm that had just thrown a whole bunch of money at us. And oh, by the way, I just figured out that the two projects we were working on were a little bit over budget and way behind schedule. And I had a whole, holy, you know what moment. And anyway, so became uh, one of the CEOs of the company um, for a four month temporary gig that is now uh, in two years, I'm now two years and two months into that four month temporary gig. Wow. Still chief creative officer and co-CEO of Meow Wolf. Wow, wow. Yeah, and talk about, you, Ali, I, I think you, you don't, don't discount the, the, the immense challenge that was handed you. You guys were opening two brand new installations in the middle of a pandemic, right. which is crazy. And by the way, I've seen all three of them. Yeah. I can't tell you which is my favorite. They're all brilliant. I think it's an extension of what Disney has done in a different way. You know, mm. it's still, it's, it's story-based. But you know the influence of the artist is the thing that I think is so incredible about it. That yeah. you're walking through, as we were talking earlier, a, you know someone's hands touched yeah. everything. Not just touched in a way like a Disney, where you had you know craftspeople. These are artists with passion for yeah. what what they do and interpreting their passion in these these grand exhibitions. That yeah. um, it's it's really hard to. To describe but it's obviously you know striking a note with the public because they're super super popular yeah. and when you walk you go through one of them you understand why yeah. now we're, we're almost at the end yeah, here so we, we got to ask you in, in five years ali where's ali rubenstein going to be um possibly on a beach in thailand <laughs> okay, <laughs> <Not a plan. laughs> um or possibly doing what I'm doing right now. You know, I love what I do. I'm so, and I'm so lucky that people keep letting me do it. Um, I, I don't know why. I, 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 don't, I don't know why they keep letting me do it, but they do. And you're a dreamer and a doer. That's and why. I love dreaming and I love doing. And um, so, you know, we'll see. Let's talk in five years. Maybe you'll come visit me in my house in Thailand, or uh, maybe we'll be checking out the next Meow Wolf exhibition in. Maybe Thailand. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so with all your infinite wisdom over all these years, what do you think makes a guest experience I mean, yet yeah, Well, you know, I think one of the things that I'm lucky enough to be able to be still developing at Meow Wolf what, Joe, what you were talking about, it's sort of the extension, an extension of what Disney started in this industry is storytelling and narrative. And to me, you know, storytelling and is what is, will always, a true, a true great story is, that is relevant today is going to be timeless tomorrow, right? And what Meow Wolf does and what we're really trying to do, what I'm lucky to be a part of is also the same thing with art. You know, a piece of art today that is relevant and authentic is going to be timeless tomorrow. So for me, you know, the combination of storytelling and art that is relevant and authentic and meaningful today is going to be relevant and timeless, uh, is going to be timeless tomorrow. So that that's my be best yeah, answer we've really ever good. gotten. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> Thank so, you, Ali. Thank yeah. You do, do, we, do we have any time for questions, <laughs> Becky? Becky, are we out of time or we can take a question? We have a few seconds left. So I'd say I'm going to go ahead and ask um, this one question. So the industry has changed so much just in the past couple of years. Do you have any advice for young people in college or beginning in the industry who want to create immersive experiences? 
do it. Never been a better time. There's so much opportunity out there. There are places, there are people that want immersive experiences. There are people to create immersive experiences, bring them together. There's places to do it. There's, there's empty storefronts, there's malls, there's, there's businesses that have gone down that are ripe and need, need art, need experiences. So just do say yes and go do it. <laughs> Just say yes. Thank <laughs> That's you, awesome. Mom. All right. Well, Ryan and Joe, where are you heading off to next? Uh, oh, I think we uh, And uh, it's, it's off to us celebrate the holidays. 2021. Here we go. Uh, the, <laughs> Happy holidays, Happy everyone. Holidays, everyone. Thank you for supporting the Zoom cast. 2021. We look forward to more amazing guests like Allie. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Allie. Bye. Thank you, guys. Love you. Bye. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So cute. All right. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Thank you so much to Allie Rubenstein for traveling with us today. On behalf of Zeitgeist Design and Production, we want to thank you for spending an hour of your precious time with us on the Spirit of the Time Zoomcast. Join us again next month when we'll Welcome our ninth passenger, the writer director of 22 of your favorite Disney theme park attractions, Jerry Reese. May tomorrow have the nostalgia of the past, the wonder of the present, and the promise of the future. Thank you guys so much. We will see you next year. <laughs>